I bow to all the seekers of Truth. <coughs> Yesterday we talked about the power that lies within us, which is the power of the Holy Ghost and which has to give us the Self-Realization. Now one may say that we have never heard about such a thing. It's a very new idea. But this is the knowledge of the roots. In the West we have the knowledge of the tree and somebody must also have the knowledge of the roots. There's nothing objectionable about it. Like in the East people learnt about science and other knowledge that the Western people gathered. In the same way, when this tree of life grew so big, there was a search inside as well. And when that search started, they in their meditative processes they found out that within us lies the power which can give us Self-realization. But this very, very ancient discovery, this is nothing new that I am telling. Only thing is that today the time has come, the blossom time has come, that many can get Self-Realization. But Self-Realization history is very, very ancient that it is said that about sixteen thousand years back, the king of all the gods called Indra got his realization. I don't know in Greek, Greek language what he is called as, but he is the one who got his realization in a place called Chidendra. Means he was made, uh, uh, the whole was made into his head, Chidendra. So this knowledge existed in our country since centuries because people had more meditative temperament. Now this meditative temperament comes because they did not have to fight the nature so much. As you know, the climate in India is quite good. People can go outside, there's no problem of too much heat or uh, too much uh, wind. It is easy to live outside. And that's how people didn't fight much of the nature. Because of the fighting with the nature, the reaction created this enthusiasm of the Western people to find out something about the nature. And that's how we discovered all the science and all the discoveries which we are enjoying. But whatever we have discovered so far is a part of the same. If you do not discover, say, all these instruments, you cannot today talk to people. You cannot propagate what is important. You cannot achieve the spiritual ascent, our mass. You cannot give it to thousands of people unless and until you have some means to do it. So even these discoveries are just complementary to the discoveries about the Self. The Kundalini has been described by many people but especially I would mention Markandeya, who lived about fourteen thousand years back. He described this Kundalini about which I told you yesterday, which resides in the triangular bone. And I told you that even the Greeks called it a sacrum bone, meaning a sacred bone. Now the word sacredness, holiness, all these are becoming sort of out of date, but there is a fact, there is something that is holy, something that is sacred. Now what is this sacredness is, what is this holiness is? 
it is rather difficult for us to know because we deal with matter. And matter doesn't talk about these things. At the most if you go on with the matter, you go on analyzing it one after another. A we reach analysis of everything, disintegrating the other parts. Like medical science now, if you start studying the human body through medical science, which I also study, you go on analyzing it. Ultimately you reach a point uh, where you will find a doctor, one doctor for one eye, another doctor for another eye. There is no synthesis, but when you go to the roots, it is the synthesis of all the uh, nature, of all the characters of a tree. So this is the difference between the approach of one to another. Now this knowledge was not written down, was told to people, con communicated to very few people and that's how it was passed on from people to people. In the earlier days they tried only on one or two persons whether they could get realization. At the time of Rama, his father-in-law <coughs> was the person who was quite deft uh, in giving realization, but he gave realization to one person called Nachiketa. So you can imagine that how difficult it was to give realization to one person. First they had to cleanse a person, then tell him to lead a very austere life, a life of balance, all kinds of things were done and then the Kundalini was made to rise. That too, one by one, every center it used to rise and then they would see that it was established. For that they had to lead a very secluded life and it was worked out when the children were about, say, twelve years of age to about twenty-five years in complete celibate life. But now, as the time has come, as I told you, that blossom time has come. But one must know that those who are sitting here have gone through it. It is not a new thing that you have come here. You are already ready for it and that's how you are going to get it. Only in this lifetime, in these modern times, we have committed some mistakes because we were cut off from this cut off from the knowledge of the roots and suddenly we became modern and in this modernism we started understanding everything through our mental projections. Now mental projection can be very mythical. Supposing I project my mind and I say that I am just now sitting in New York, I am feeling like this and that, it's just a mental projection. Whatever we do has to be real but mostly mental projections are mythical. And many people have done that and have been successful in life so-called. They have made lots of money, they have put their mental projections to this, mental projections to that, I said, this is knowledge, this is knowledge, this is knowledge. And how are we to make out whether this is true or not? Is there any absolute method by which we can make out whether this is true or not? The reason is the absolute is nowhere nowhere to be seen, it's the relative life in which we live. Now the words like holiness or the words like sacredness and auspiciousness have lost their value because we have lost the sense of that knowledge, that sensitivity. As I told you yesterday that I went to Rome and the mayor there, just seeing my photograph, just said, oh, this is divinity and he helped us so much. But the thing that has acted in him is that sensitive temperament which he, they have retained somehow or other or it existed within him. But we have to understand that every matter has a kind of a coefficients by which it can tell you whether it is sacred or not, which is holy or not. Like in India we say that if this place is holy. Now how do we say this is a holy place? How do we understand this is a holy place? Because a person who is a realized soul, who may not be a rich man, he may be a poor man, he might be just a ascetic, he may be a married man, but a realized soul is a category, is a state of mind. If he has, he can feel the 
divine vibrations from that place and can say, oh, this is a holy place. I'll give an instance. In uh, Rahuri is a place uh, uh, called as Musalwadi. And that place they have got a huge big lake. And that lake was uh, to be put into proper channel, so they thought make a big bund on it. So they tried to make an English bun. It is about fifty, sixty years back an English engineer tried to make a bun there. And at a point he found he could not build anything. The thing that he built used to fall down. Again he used to build something used to fall down. So he was surprised. Then one Muslim fakir, as we call them, a realized soul came that way. He said, Oh, this place you leave it. This is a holy place. You cannot do anything. You better leave it alone. So they went round that place. Can you imagine a bun going uh, straight like this? And the place is like that. So when I went to that place, they asked me, Mother, we would like you to see if it is a holy place. I took some of the Sahaja yogis who are sitting here. And when we went there, we found it was emitting cool breeze from that place. You could feel it. All of us could feel it. Now, it is something, a miracle for people to think that uh, how this can give cool breeze. Now, as you know, that the spiritual touch of anything starts emitting vibrations. There's another example I'll give you. When I went to Kashmir once and uh, we were driving along a road and I just felt tremendous vibrations coming from somewhere. So I asked the driver, I said, is there a temple here or something? He said, no, it's all wilderness. I said, all right, uh, let's go the way the vibrations are coming. So we went to a place of complete wilderness and passed through that and then we saw some poor people living there, some Muslims. So I asked them, uh, is there any temple here? They said, no, we don't have, but we have a mosque ahead. I said, what mo mosque is that? They said, this is Hazrat Bal. I said, Hazrat Bal? She said, there's one hair of Muhammad Saab kept there. I caught it about five, seven miles away from there. So we went and we saw, and I saw it was there because it was emitting vibrations. Of course, we couldn't see the hair because the hair was kept inside. Now, this is the thing we have been told even in the Bible, that whatever is created by Mother Earth or by the sky is not to be reproduced and worshipped. Now we must think what is created by the Mother Earth. We never think on those lines. We just accept whatever people give us the interpretation. But let us think what is created by the Mother Earth. This is what are the holy places created by Mother Earth. Say, for example, Stonehenge that you have here. Perhaps you do not know it's a holy thing. All these stones have come out of the Mother Earth, then some stupid people must have taken it out, tuned it up, put these things. But actually the stones that have come out are really the stones that have come out of the Mother Earth. And if you go there and see, it has vibrations. Not only that, but it is made in the way, same way as this Kundalini is. So you had on this island some people who knew the knowledge of the Divine. They definitely knew, otherwise how is it they went round and made a circular thing like that and they even now go, these Druids go and worship there. But they don't know what they are doing, they have no idea what they are doing. As I told you yesterday, like Muhammad Sahib has told you how to do namaz, but the Muslims don't know why to do namaz, what does that mean, what all these things mean, what Allahu Akbar means, they just do it because they are told. So there's a gap between what we are told and the gap between what it is. But there is a coefficient of divinity in a thing. Unless and until you become the spirit, you cannot feel it. Like the magnet can feel the magnetism. In the same way, you have to become that which can feel all those beautiful things which we call as the divine vibrations. Now, the divine vibration flows within us when we get our Self-realization. Before that, we are cut off from our spirit. The spirit resides in our heart. And we are, our attention is not enlightened by that spirit. The spirit watches us like a witness. It watches us, sees how we behave, where we go, what we do. Everything is just watching, it's a spectator. 
that's the situation is of God also. God Almighty is watching the play. He's watching the play of His power, which we call as the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is the power, or we can say is the Mother, who, d who has created the whole world, who has created the whole universe, and is showing the play to one spectator, that is the God Almighty. And He is watching all that play. And when he is watching that play, he wants to enjoy it. The moment he doesn't like it, he can destroy it. In the same way within ourselves resides this spirit which watches us and sees what we are up to, what we do. But the Kundalini, this one, which is the Holy Ghost, the reflection of the Holy Ghost, which resides in the triangular bone, records everything that we do. It's just like a tape recorder. It records what we do, what have been our hankering, where have we been, what we have been doing. It's a subtler knowledge, for that we have to extend ourselves and understand that at the human level you can only go into four dimensions at the most, but the fourth one is also in the thinking. Three dimensions actually exist for you, but the fourth dimension is in your thinking. You have imagined, you have listened to people, you have been told by people, it has been uh, described to you, but it is not part and parcel of your being, it's just you know as there, it's something else, it's not yourself. Now this fourth dimension you have to achieve. So to know this fourth dimension there has to be some arrangement within us. If we are created for that, if we have to become the fourth dimension, there must be some arrangement within us and this is the arrangement we have got of uh, our subtle being which remains working as parasympathetic nervous system. Now this parasympathetic nervous system is a system within us which nourishes us, gives us balance, repairs us, just like a fountain of every energy but that too has limited energy. Sympathetic nervous system we use when we have any emergencies. As we run fast, uh, we develop a very high speed and the heart can start pumping very fast. But when we relax, heart comes back to its own position. That happens through the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system also repairs us all the time, but it has a limited energy and that's how uh, diseases are caused because we exhaust our limited energies due to some reason. Maybe it may be that we have overused it so much that it is not to be now fulfilled by the parasympathetic. All these things happen and we develop diseases of different kinds. As I told you yesterday, we have three powers within us. One of them is the left-hand side power of desire, the second power is the right-hand side power of action and the central power of our evolution. So the left-hand side power is manifested outside in the growth as left sympathetic nervous system and the right-hand side is manifested within us as the right sympathetic nervous system and the central one, the parasympathetic. So, in the gross we call them by these names. Now, the evolutionary process has taken place since long. It's not today that the evolution has been going on. At the matter level, the evolution takes place when we have the periodic table and the carbon is placed in the center and balancing, it has four valences. Then it becomes higher and higher and higher. At the human stage, when we come, we start balancing ourselves, like trial and error. First we try this, now oh, it's no good, it doesn't help us, so try another. It's like we try uh, capitalism, then communism, then capitalism, then communism, we try all these things. It's just we go from one extreme to another extreme, then we try to come to the center. And when we come to the center, that's the time our ascent takes place. It's not going to the left or to the right. Now the left represents our past and the right represents our future. So we have to be in the present. At this moment we have to be there, but we cannot be. We can. Now for example people might be thinking at this time about the past. 
maybe about the future, whether I'll get a conveyance or not. But at this moment we cannot stay. But when we come to this moment there is no thought, there is no thought. One thought rises and falls off, another thought rises and falls off. In between the thought there's a little gap and that gap is the present. And that we cannot feel within ourselves because we live in the past or in the future. So when this Kundalini rises, what she does, she elongates those thoughts. And by that elongation the gap between the two thoughts elongates, we can say increases and we become thoughtlessly aware. But in the movement of the Kundalini, when the Kundalini moves from this state, when it rises, first it enters, as you see, into the first chakra of the, this green chakra, which we can call as the Nabi chakra. The Nabi chakra is the one which we can the navel center or the solar plexus. In the, in the gross is called as solar plexus which has got ten subplexuses in the same way this has got ten petals. It's said there are ten petals. Now this is a very important center for us because this is the center where we start our evolution. As animals we were seeking food, we were seeking protection and that's how we evolved. Then now at a human stage this seeking is manifested as we seek power, people want to become members of parliament, they start, is all seeking in the power. Then some people want to have money, possessions, they start, we seek in possessions. Some people think that this is my son, this is my child, this is my, my business goes on and they call it love and it's very possessiveness also sometimes and that's also manifest. But then they discover that these things do not give you joy. There's something beyond that must be giving us joy. And when that comes within our awareness, then our real evolution starts. That's the point one has to reach. That's a special category of people whom we call as seekers. But at this point it's a very dangerous thing. I warned you before also, two years back, I told you that there are people in the market who are just waiting to catch hold of you because they are here just to make money, nothing else. It's all money-oriented. And when you are seeking, they just grab you. They tell you, all right, five pounds for this and you get caught. Can you imagine such nonsense they talk? And people believe them. How can you get your evolution? By giving money, think of it. And when I told this, they were so angry with me. I said, you cannot, you cannot organize, it's a natural process, it's your birthright to get your Realization and nobody can charge you money, it's ridiculous. You are very intelligent people, you have got sciences and all that, but in these matters you don't know anything, you are naive to accept these things as that you can pay for God, you can uh, pay for your evolution, you can pay for your Realization. The same thing uh, here happens to you when you start seeking, then you think we must do something, or we must put in some effort. As I told you yesterday, with effort you go in the wrong direction. Either you move to the left side or to the right side. So when you move to the left side, what happens? You get possessed. You get possessed because on the left side is all your collective consciousness is there. Cancer is caused by possessions, that is the one that triggers. I saw a television show in which they told me, the doctors uh, were telling uh, people that the vulnerability of the cancer is first established because when sympathetic is too much active, vulnerable you become. But triggering takes place with some proteins called protein 58 and protein 52, of course they give just names, uh, they attack you. And the triggering comes from the area which is built within us since our creation, means the collective subconscious. So unless and until you get possessed by something, cancer cannot be triggered, though we are vulnerable every moment because we are so much on the sympathetic, all the time we are in emergency. 
So this kind of an attack comes to us from this area which is built within us known as collective consciousness, subconscious. Now this collective subconscious is existing within us since our creation. Now if you start moving too much into say bow to someone and submit to someone and that guru is an expert on all these things which we call in Sanskrit language as Preta Vidya, Smashana Vidya is the, uh, is the knowledge of the dead. Then they can entice you, they can mesmerize you, they can ask you to kill yourself, they can do what they like, they'll say, go and destroy yourself. You have heard of such cases where people have destroyed. But we must use our intelligence to understand that are we to destroy ourselves now? Then there are another kind, they will say, you have to jump like frogs, you have to uh, jump all the time. Anybody can jump, what is so great? But are we to become frogs or worms? Then some people going to these things, I mean TM now, I must tell you openly, I have so many people coming from TM suffering from epilepsy, absolutely they suffer from epilepsy, no doubt about it. And they have come to me and the person who was the director of their uh, academy in, uh, what was the place, Ronock, Ronock, in, uh, in uh, Scotland, he came to me and he was suffering from epilepsy, his wife was suffering from epilepsy, his child was suffering from epilepsy. The fellow was such a rich man, he was a diamond merchant, he became a bankrupt, he had to go away to South Africa. The wife is now gone to India, but she's so fed up of life. Now, of course, she's cured with Sahaja Yoga and the child is all right. So they paid thousands of pounds, thousand, six thousand pounds they paid to this man to go to Switzerland where they were given food for six days in such way that first day only the water that has boiled some potato. Then the second day, that same water, third day the same water, fourth day the same water and the fifth day they were given the rind of the potato with all the filth. Imagine what a mockery! And last day the potato. And six thousand pounds they paid each, is a fact. There are so many sitting here from Tia who have been cured. Now people go just headlong, why? Because they wanted to fly. Who has flown? Put their guru onto one of these uh, Pisa, what you call, leaning tower of Tisa, Pisa. Let him fly, let's see, can he fly? He cannot fly. But when I tell about them, people don't like it because I'm telling you the truth, that understand you cannot pay for it. Now why do you want to fly? I can't understand. Are you going to become birds? All these queer and strange ideas, how can any intelligent man go to? But the reason I ask them sometimes, why, why did you? There's a Jew girl, very intelligent, she's very well educated and a barrister and all that. She had big problems. I asked her, why, why did you go to Tia? What was so great? This is all stupid they did. Then why did you go? She said, I was so fed up with the fanaticism of the Jews that I jumped into it. Another one says, I was so fed up with the Catholics that I went there. Another says, the Christians were so this way, I went there. This is going from fire to frying pan. How the brain works, I don't understand, but it is so much a common sense to understand. If somebody says that by saying some words you are going to fly in the air, for that you have to pay some money and you accept it, I must say that somebody has really enticed you and mesmerized you, otherwise nobody who is sane would accept such an absurd thing. Isn't it? And I was shocked because these are the seekers. Again, I say the special category of people who are seeking God. Then another group comes from India. It's another thugs, I tell you. Real thugs. You must know that Indians are now trying to attack you in a subtle way. Definitely. Because you attacked them in a very gross way, so now they are attacking you. Same thing happening in America. You go and destroy them, they are not dead, they are there. They are attacking back Americans. And that's how you are attacked and you accept these things because, you see, they pamper your ego, perhaps, because they tell you something very intellectual, big things and you accept. Why don't you go and find out what's happening to the people? How many people have gone to the lunatic asylum? 
and they have money, they have so much money, they can hush up anything. There was one fellow who ran away from India to America because he, Indians couldn't bear him. And this fellow who went, ran away to America, you see, a picture was made about them, I, what was that, is God who ran away or something like that. That picture was shown here in the BBC. BBC showed it, we have got the tape of that. But this fellow has so much money that he purchased that picture from BBC. And now it cannot be shown to the public, I wish I could show you that. But in the private, in the drawing rooms you can see. All these tricks are there. You see, so the money itself begets money, also begets all kinds of trickeries. You gave him money, you gave them money and they are playing money on you. One must understand that as far as God is concerned, keep money away. Anybody who asks for money is seeking money, how can he talk of God? This seeking can take you to the right side also, like these lamas are, all these people are doing right side jobs, what we call the supraconscious jobs, the collective supraconscious. Lamas, you see, you must have known that Hitler took advice from lamas. Lamas gave them advice how to capture these spirits who are very aggressive, very ruthless, very uh, heartless people, emotionless, and that's how he managed to entice these Germans who are still there. Even in this country or everywhere you can find these horrible aggressive uh, spirits are hovering on people who try to destroy others. So that work is still on that play is still on. Actually, I must say, in the West people have, are so naive, they have no idea about the debt. What happens about the debt, they don't know. And they play about. For example, to have all the dead bodies in the church is very dangerous for children. Special care must be taken when you take your children to the cemetery. It's very dangerous. I mean, Indian churches don't have anything like that. No Indian would tolerate a nonsense like that to have to walk on the graves. Imagine a lady came here to see the cathedral. They took her out. She's walking like this. I said, "Why? You see, all dead are lying here. How to walk on top of that?" We have no idea as to how this dead acts, and all these diseases are so common in this country or in the West are because we have not paid any attention to keep out the dead. Now this knowledge was not with you, that's why they took advantage of you, they came down here upon you and enticed you. And this enticement is so subtle that you can make it out. Then in India we grow all kinds of drugs, all kinds of drugs. I've never seen any drug all my life, nor do I know one person who's an Indian who takes drugs, can you imagine? But here the drugs have crawled into you. How? because these people have introduced, and the dead, those dead who want drugs wanted to drink. Even alcoholism, if you go maximum to that side, can take you to that kind of enticement. Alcoholism can be cured by Sahaja Yoga because it's a spirit that is drinking, it's not that you are drinking. Like I had a lady from Cuba, a thin little petite lady, and her husband told me she can take one bottle of whiskey neat. I said, eh? she looks such a little thing, how can she take one bottle? Yes, she does. So I asked her, I put a uh, bandhan as we call it on her and I saw a huge big negro coming out of her. I asked her, did you know any negro? She said, Mother, you see him, you see him, this is the one who drinks, everyone blames me. <laughs> really she said so. And now she's a cured woman. So all these extreme things, if you go, if you go to the extreme of the right, now people are jogging like mad. I mean, one should not do anything of extremes. Little bit is all right. But going like mad, everybody running fast, like, you'll get heart attacks. You must understand. You'll get heart attacks in no time. Wearing tight clothes to that extent, you will get varicose veins. You will develop all these uh, troubles of your uh, knees and all that. You must understand you should be normal people, you should keep yourself 
in a way that you do everything in a moderate manner, so you keep in the central path of evolution. But going to the extreme of everything is our style. We go to extremes, as Indians also go to some extremes and you go to another extremes. We can see the uh, French going to another extremes. Everybody is like that, they are towards the extremes. But keep a moderate life. And the one who leads a moderate life is very easy for him to get his ascent. Now the same seeking becomes the seeking of God, seeking of beyond, seeking of something higher. And that higher is the Spirit. You have to become the Spirit and when you become the Spirit, what happens to you? That we have to see. When you become the Spirit, physically you get all right, automatically. When you start getting the vibrations, physically you are all right. Leukemia can be cured, cancer can be cured, so many things can be cured. Why? Because the exhausted energy that is in your centers gets refilled, you get connected from here to the whole, to the subtler energy which is nourishing, which is permeated into everything, which is nourishing everything, you get in contact with that, this is the yoga. And all the time that energy is flowing within you. When it is flowing within you, you do not get into tensions. Not only that, but this connection makes you an universal being. You become part and parcel of the whole. You are already, but you are not aware. For this finger is aware that it is a part and parcel of the whole. But we are not aware that we are part and parcel of the whole. So what happens that we feel, oh, we have helped this gentleman, we have helped that gentleman, we have done so much for that person. Actually, whom do you help? You help yourself. If this finger is sick and if this finger rubs it, is it helping anyone? In the same way in Sahaja Yoga we are not helping anyone, we are helping ourselves because it just flows to that area which requires help. That's how. But you become collectively conscious, you start feeling where you are lacking that vitality in what center you lack it, on your fingertips, as I told you that English language has a beautiful a sentence called fingertips. So on your fingertips you can feel it, what is lacking in another person. Then the compassion flows, you become the compassion. You don't have to say, oh, I am so compassionate. Well, you are compassionate, but it is a compassion that starts flowing. And when it starts flowing, you enjoy. You don't say, I do it, you say, it goes, it comes. You start talking in a third person. The word I goes away, I believe, doesn't it? Then we say, we believe, because we are not alone, we are so many. How can we say, I, who is the I? I is lost in we. The energy flows to another person without any difficulty, but inside yourself the peace, the joy that you feel, the attention is so enlightened that you pay attention to anyone and the person feels all right. You think of anyone, you want to know, just put your hands. Like we have someone here from Scotland. He was one of the first few who got realization and very great intellectual. So he started doubting. He thought, how can it be sitting down here? I can feel something. I said, all right, what do you want to know about? He said, my father has not telephoned for some time. I would like to know. I said, all right, you put your hands like this and try to find out how is your father. You know, very gross level it is. So he put his hand. He said, Mother, I'm getting a burning hair. What does that mean? said, it means that your father has a very, very bad uh, throat trouble. He said, really? I said, yes, this, these are all your father's centers and this center is for the throat. So he telephoned, very bad bronchitis, this is the word I used. And he telephoned to his house and his mother answered and he said, where is father? He said, he's down with very bad bronchitis. He was amazed. I said, all right, we'll cure him now. And we just rubbed his finger quite a lot and there it was, the phone came after one hour, your father is all right, surprisingly, miraculously, I don't know how he got well. So physically you are all right. Mentally I have seen many mad people become all right because how you become mad is that there is an imbalance. You went on to the left side too much, you are pulled back, you become all right. 
then emotionally you develop a balance. You see, all the time we say, my, my, this is my sister, till we discover that she's a snake in the grass, she's my sister, she's my husband, my wife, she is my father, all the but then you see them in their real way. For example, maybe your own sister may be a snake in the grass and maybe your husband may be a gem of a person, but how do you know? How do you know that this person is like that or that? On your vibrations you can see. Same thing you can ask about these gurus who have come. You ask just a question, what do you think of this guru? Now, anyone. If he's a horrible one, you will get burning on your head. Sometimes you get blisters on your fingers and you are surprised how you got these blisters. But the people who are enticed by them are absolutely gone cases. Till they are absolutely finished, they don't come to search you. It's very difficult to convince them that you get out of it, you are enticed, because they think, firstly they have paid for it, so they must go through it. It's a human nature. Supposing you have paid a ticket for a drama or a play and you don't like it, but still you have paid for it to sit down, all right, I have paid for it, better go through it. Like that. They want to go through it. But those who are insane, how can you talk to them? The another thing that happens to your attention is that your attention becomes very balanced. All the time our eyes are going out to this, to that, to that, our eyes become weak and we become really confused because every time we see something, you see a reaction comes in, now I come to this place, I see, oh, how many holes, then I start counting the holes and people are really mad, I've seen. They see advertisement, they'll say, this advertisement, that advertisement. If they miss one, they'll turn around and say, oh, I missed that. <laughs> it's like that, it's a craze with our attention which goes out all the time like mad and it reacts back. And when it reacts, what happens to us that we become a confusion, a complicated personality. And we do not know what to see, what not to see. Now when your attention is enlightened, you just become a pure personality, your eyes become pure. You just see purity, you can't see impure things. If you see something impure, you feel horrible, you don't want to do it. Like our awareness gets that purity. For example, if you take a dog through a dirty lane, he'll just walk through, he'll have no problem. But human beings will have to close their nose, they may not even go through that. But after realization, you know what is sin, what is not sin. And you can walk through the places which are beautiful, but if it is a sinful place, you don't like it, you don't enjoy it, your priorities change immediately. You become such a virtuous person, you are surprised at yourself, what has happened to me? I have known people who have been so-called, uh, all kinds of things they call it, I don't know what names, but all sorts of perverted people, I can say in general, uh, they, if they come to Sahaja Yoga, they become such beautiful husbands, such nice wives, such straightforward people, enjoy their married life, enjoy their children and enjoy each other with purity. Now our society here in the West, for me it is now my society because I am sitting here, Indian society has its problems, you have your problems, but the society has become so funny that uh, we say that uh, if you have an Indian in your house, maybe your things might disappear. But if you have an Englishman or a Western man in your house, maybe your wife may disappear. It's a dangerous thing. And nobody minds it, it's love, you see. Any nonsense is love. You spoil anybody's daughter, anything, it's love. All wrong ideas. If there's purity, say, everybody is a sister or a brother or a mother, a pure relationship, the life becomes so much easier, you don't know. Sahaja yogis are like that, they travel thousands. This time they went to Switzerland, we had one program there, a seminar, they all live together, no problem. Otherwise, if so many people live there, half of the marriages would have been broken down and so many would have eloped and come back again to say that we have divorced again. This madness of divorce has come because our, our ideas have confused us, we are confused. There is no purity, 
if a pure person like that even looks at such a person, he becomes pure. Like Mari Magdalini, when she was blessed by Christ, she became a pure woman. So the purity has to be brought in the society. If you have to save this society, you have to purify yourself. Every individual has to purify oneself. Now they say this is freedom, this is license, this is not freedom. Freedom is where there is purity. Without purity there is no freedom, is abandonment, is nonsense. And that's how we have felt about our life. Of course, when I'm saying that, please don't feel guilty because that is another thing can happen to you. It's just I'm saying, just telling you how you purify, but don't feel guilty about anything because whatever I say you have to forget about it. When I'm giving you realization, don't remember all these points, otherwise it will be difficult to give you realization. So that's past, finished, gone case, don't worry on that. Just think that how we immediately become part and parcel of a pure, beautiful society. The race that has been described, the race of God, that what William Blake has described, that men of God will become prophets and they'll have powers to make others prophets. For example, for a saint there is nothing like a temptation, he doesn't do wrong things, why? He just doesn't do, he doesn't have to tell himself that I don't run away with his things or I don't run away with his wife or I don't do this wrong or I don't murder anybody, he doesn't have to remember that these ten commandments are there, he's just there. He doesn't have to remember. How? Because he's gone above that. These ten commandments are in this chakra. In this chakra are these ten commandments that we have to keep a balance, don't do this, don't do that. That was all right at the time of Moses. If you say these days don't do, you'll have it. So best thing is to raise your Kundalini. Once you become the Spirit, you become your own master, you start guiding yourself, you know what is wrong, you don't just like it. I don't have to tell you, you just don't like it, you become a different personality. Like I told you, a dog becomes a human being, he doesn't like a dirty lane. And when a human, became, human being becomes a saint, he doesn't like it, he doesn't like it. But it doesn't mean that you run away to Himalaya, you run away from here, nothing. You lead absolutely a normal life, but you are a detached person. And that's how you enjoy the most. For example, see this carpet is beautiful. It's not mine, I don't possess it, thank God. I can enjoy it better than the person who possesses it because he might, the one who possesses it, might be thinking, might be dirty, you know, mother is sitting there, God knows what's going to happen to the carpet, I may have to take it for dry cleaning or some sort of a problem will be in his mind. But for me, nothing, I'm just enjoying. So this idea of possession is a myth, we do not possess anything, it's a myth created by human beings, you see, they have a registration office where they put it, this is, belongs to this person, but can we carry it with us when we die? It's all outside. And that's how we understand. And then we understand something very, very beautiful about matter, that the matter is for giving others. Matter is to express our feelings to others. And you become generosity. And generosity has its own blessings. I enjoy my generosity very much, but sometimes, you know, I feel generosity gives a problem to me because I open one door to give and ten doors are open to give me. Now I don't know where to keep them, you see, it's very difficult. Now we had a big house, now my husband is saying, you better have another big house. I said, why? He said, these things, what to do? Every day, you see, you are having from ten doors while you are giving from one door. Now, if I open ten doors, there will be twenty doors open. Generosity fills you completely. You are not at all in need of anything. You try that. Open your heart. You have to open your heart. People don't open their heart, they are so frightened. They'll open a chink and see who's there. Oh, I see. It may be raining. It may be a snowy day, a lady might be standing with a perambulator and a child would be inside that, but she'll be afraid to see from a chink. Who is going to invade you? Who can destroy you? Who can destroy your spirit? Just enjoy your generosity. See how you will have everything. I'll give you a very small example of this in my own lifetime. I've been like this all my life 
and uh, my husband had problems and my family had problems because of this. One day I was just sitting outside and knitting something when I saw a lady coming down with two other men and she said, we are refugees from Punjab, we have no place to live in. And I had a huge house because my father was member of the parliament and he had a huge house of his own. So I said, all right, there's a room here, you come along and settle down. Well, I didn't ask who they were, what they were doing, I said, it's an outside room, let them stay there. They stayed. Then my brother came in, you see, he's now, uh, he is now a minister, you see, very careful man, and my husband came in. And my brother screwed into his brain that this is wrong, we don't know, these may be thieves, these may be these, and my sister always does like that, I don't know what's going to happen to us, you know. I said, whatever they are, they are my responsibility now, you are not going to drive them out at any cost. At that time a war started and people came to kill and one of them was a Muslim. So he, the people came in our house and they said, we have heard there's a Muslim staying in your house. I said, see this, I'm a Christian but I put on this. I said, see this is a mark, now do you believe me or not? I said, you better get out for me and they went away. And this, the fellow was saved, you see. Now he was a very great poet. I went to Bombay long, long uh, years later, I should say about twelve or fourteen years later, and we were making a little film about something and I was uh, uh, dealing with it. So I said, I know this lady, uh, but I won't come there to ask her because she was a great film actress. I said, I will not ask her because she'll have no choice. They said, but you must say something about it. I said, no, nothing, to I'm not coming, you go and ask her. So they went and asked her, she said, no, 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 I cannot join, I must have so much money and you cannot have me for nothing at all and this I don't believe in all these charities, this, that. So I kept quiet, didn't say anything. But for the opening of the film I went and she was there, she looked at me and tears started rolling her eyes and just came and embraced me. She said, I didn't know you were with this. I said, I know you didn't know. But she said, forgive me, I'll give money, I'll give everything. This is the lady who saved me long time back. And everybody was amazed how this lady who was so materialistic and so particular about her payment has suddenly melted away. She said, Oh God, now I learned, I've forgotten, I've forgotten what it means to be generous. And she was completely changed after that. So all these things are the quality of the Spirit. It is not afraid of anyone. Why should you be afraid of anyone if you are one with God? Look at Christ. He had nothing to do with a prostitute, but when people started hitting her with a stone, he came up and he said, Now, among you who has not committed any sin can throw a stone at me. Imagine the courage. The courage comes from the Spirit, because he was Spirit, so he could say such a thing. He was not a man compromising with his values. All right, if you want, we can have discotheque in the church. Or we can start a pub, nowadays they are selling it for pubs. Let us compromise. Truth cannot compromise. It does not. Compassion is different from compromise. It cannot compromise, truth stands on its own legs. So that's what happened when Christ said that, and that happens to you, you become a strong person. You become a person who is strong, but does not try to oppress others. You do not try to destroy others. You do not want to hate anyone, but what you do is to stand up on your own, to stand up for the rights of others, to stand up for something great. Like we will say Abraham Lincoln, a person like him. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was a realized soul and how he fought for the rights, how he talked about democracy. Today, let's compromise this, let's compromise that. Even if somebody is a Hitler, doesn't matter, as long as he is with us, all right, accept him. To have that strength, you have to be the Spirit, so you become a very strong, compassionate person. Only a person who is strong can be compassionate. How can a weakling be a compassionate person, tell me? A tree which is strong can only give shelter to people, or do you think a falling tree can shelter people, on the contrary it will fall on the people. Our ideas are very, very confused about compassion and when you become such a strong person, you see the truth before you. You know the truth 
and you are no more afraid of anyone. And God looks after you, the best part of it. You just don't worry. God looks after you in every inch of the world, every inch of the world, in material way, in your emotional way, in your physical way, every way you feel surrounded by His love and His guidance and His help. He does in such a way, I'll give you a very recent example of such yogis. They wanted to go to a place, a very beautiful uh, hill, uh, mountain peak, which is known as Zermatt in uh, Switzerland. And it's a very expensive place to go to, because I told them something about that, it looks like a, one of the deities and all that, they were wanting to go and have a seminar there. It's a very expensive place and we cannot pay for that, they, they thought that it will be very difficult because uh, they are not so well off. So I said, all right, you go and find out. So the people went down to find out and there is a huge big hotel-like place. And, uh, oh, they said, when do you want to come? So they said, such and such date. Oh, for that date, they just ran. Oh, very good, very good. If you want to come for those dates, we somehow or other cannot fill those dates. So we are very happy. And the, they were charging 70 francs per night and for three days, now they are charging us how much? 33 francs for three days. Means about 11 pounds or 12 pounds. Can you imagine? And now all of them can go and see. Now, this is just a miracle and so many miracles take place like that. Even the poster they have put here, you have seen a big poster uh, in Brighton. Now we can't afford because we don't take any money, We whatever little money they have they collect and put things. They were finding it impossible to advertise. We cannot compete with these false people on two things. Firstly, we cannot advertise the way they can because they have money and secondly, we cannot go on telling lies the way they do. They can tell any lies, they'll say that uh, we, we will create a new world for you and there will be our goal for you and all those, because they are liars. We have our limitations, we cannot tell you lies. So this uh, advertising thing also was impossible for us to do it, but they did it for a song, just for a song.